attendees are in listen only mode. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2018 hurricane season webinar sponsored by ARRL. This is Mike Corey, KI1U. I am the ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager, and I will be your host and moderator tonight. Before we introduce our panel of guest speakers, I want to go over a few housekeeping uh, items. And one moment, there we go. Get the slides going. Um, first of all, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the ARRL YouTube channel later this week. We have an hour and a half block scheduled on the webinar platform, and we will do our best to conclude the webinar within this time frame. The webinar platform allows the audience to post questions to the moderator during the webinar. Please use this tool to send in your questions. We will address them as we go and then do a final Q&A session at the end to handle any we might have missed. If for some reason we do not get to your question, please feel free to reach out to the appropriate presenter by email. Contact information will be provided towards the end of the session. And we have a, uh, a great lineup for you tonight. Um, uh, many returning from, from uh, last year's uh, hurricane webinar. Uh, first up, we will hear from Bob Robichaud, VE1MBR from the Canadian Hurricane Center. Bob will provide us with a meteorological overview of this year's Atlantic hurricane season. Next, uh, uh, myself and Dave Isker and one RSN will present on a couple league topics. I'll present on the role of headquarters during hurricane response with a particular focus on the 2017 season and what we learned from that. Today, we'll talk about some of the media and public relations uh, issues about hurricane response. We'll then hear from Julio Ripple, WD4R, about amateur radio at the National Hurricane Center, WX4NHC. And then we will hear from Rob Macedo, KD1CY. Rob will cover the role of VOIP hurricane net. And then finally, we will hear from Bill Feast, WBZH, and he will cover the role of Saturn during hurricane response. Unfortunately, Bobby Graves, KB5HAV from the Hurricane Watch Net, will not be able to join us tonight due to an unforeseen schedule conflict. But most of the presenters uh, tonight are familiar with the work of the Hurricane Watch Net, and we will be sure to cover some of the uh, topics related to them. So uh, without further ado, I will turn this over to Bob Robichaud, VE1MBR, to give us the meteorological overview of this season. Uh, Bob, give me just a second, and I will uh, turn the controls over to you. OK, Bob, you there? Yep, right here. OK, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, this year's uh, uh, briefing. Uh, my part of it, given that uh, we're so early in the hurricane season, is going to be quite short. What I'm going to do is uh, just give you a uh, current situation uh, in the tropics right now. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, <coughs> the um, northeastern Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, we'll look at um, uh, storms in uh, in both uh, basins uh, so far this year, and then we'll look at some factors uh, that are influencing a hurricane season uh, this uh, this year, uh, and then we'll look at the updated outlook for the hurricane season. So the current situation right now in the tropics, uh, it's a little bit busier in the northeastern uh, Pacific than it is in the Atlantic. Uh, this uh, satellite image is from uh, our GOES East um, uh, satellite, uh, uh, NOAA satellite that was um, launched just a couple of years ago. It's a state-of-the-art satellite. Um, and as um, we can see a couple of storms here, one... Uh, a couple in the Pacific, and then one a tropical wave that is um, uh, uh, in the Caribbean right now, just uh, in, uh, northwest of Venezuela. Uh, if uh, we look towards the, um, I'm going to see if I can draw here. Um, okay. So this area in here is essentially off the coast of Africa. This is Africa over here. This is uh, what we call a Saharan dust um, layer, and that's a, a layer of very dry, uh, warm air that uh, it, it's, it counteracts any kind of hurricane development. So in that part of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we don't expect a whole lot of activity here, uh, at least over the next uh, week or so. 
This is the uh, tropical wave that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is Hurricane Bud uh, in the Pacific right here. And this is what's left of uh, Hurricane um, uh, Alita in, in the um, uh, Pacific. So what I'm going to do is just uh, get out of uh, the drawing mode here. I can do that. Okay. So this is a closer view of the uh, Pacific, and we can see uh, what's left of Alita, which actually reached Category 4 hurricane status. Um, a few days ago, and we have Hurricane Bud, that is uh, currently a major hurricane, Category 3 on the Saffir Simpson scale. Um, so that's what's going on right now in the northeastern uh, Pacific. Uh, if we look at uh, post-tropical depression Alita, which was just declared a post-tropical earlier uh, today, um, this is the expected uh, motion. So. Uh, it, it looks a little bit different. It has an odd shape. Uh, the cone has an odd shape. It looks more like a circle. That's because of the slow nature uh, of the motion of the storm. If we look at uh, Bud, as I mentioned, uh, Bud is a Category 3 hurricane with winds of 120 miles per hour. The core is actually moving slightly away from Mexico, but the rain bands are still expected to impact some of the coastal areas. Uh, we do expect some strengthening over the next uh, 6 to 12 hours, followed by some gradual weakening. And some of the winds, uh, especially tropical storm force winds, could reach the coast of uh, Mexico into uh, the Baja Peninsula uh, by Wednesday. Uh, this is the graphic at the bottom left. Um, those are the, the probability, probability of tropical storm force winds. The image on the, on the bottom right is the probability of hurricane force winds. So we expect uh, hurricane force winds to remain offshore, not affect land per se. In the Atlantic side of things, uh, we do have a tropical wave, as I mentioned, northwest uh, of Venezuela. Um, so no actual named storms in the Atlantic as uh, we speak. However, this area of disturbed weather, this tropical, <laughs> tropical wave, um, has about a 20% chance of becoming a tropical cyclone here in the next five days or so. Um, and in probably headed in a kind of a northwesterly direction. So a low probability of formation, but there could still be some uh, heavy, some brief heavy showers associated with that uh, weather system. So where we are so far this, uh, this season for 2018 in the Northeast uh, Pacific, we've had two storms, both of them reached a major hurricane status. Uh, and that's a little bit above uh, average uh, for this time of the year, this point in the hurricane season. Um, and in the Atlantic, we've had one named storm. That storm was Alberto. Uh, it uh, reached uh, tropical storm strength, although it was uh, more of a subtropical storm, meaning that it had characteristics of both a tropical and a non-tropical storm. Uh, that was actually a pre-season storm. It formed before the, um, the official start of the hurricane season. Uh, so we had one named storm, and that's uh, roughly about average, but again, it's still very, very early in the hurricane season. We see that things really start to pick up once we hit to August. Uh, we tend to have, on average, three or so named storms in the month of August, with September being the peak month of hurricane season. And then it starts to drop off a little bit in the early part of October, and then it drops off even faster in the latter part of October. So uh, we still have a little ways to go before we uh, get into the peak of hurricane season. So what are some of the factors that we're looking at uh, that will determine the activity in specifically the Atlantic um, hurricane season this year? Uh, we look at uh, a number of things. These are kind of the main things that we look at. One is water temperature. Water temperature is really, uh, the warm water is really what drives these storms. We look at whether or not there's a lot of wind shear, and we look at something called the multi-decadal cycle, which I'll mention in a minute. So let's look at water temperature. 
Uh, some of you may have uh, either attended or um, joined via webinar um, to our uh, presentations at the National Hurricane Conference. Uh, I actually showed this uh, at this conference, and this is a water temperature uh, in mid-March of this year. So the red indicates warmer temperature, and the blue indicates colder water temperature. So again, this was uh, water temperature in March. So if we go and look at water temperature now, we see that certainly the water temperature has increased, uh, as you would expect going into the summer season. If I go back to March, you kind of take a look at the Western uh, Caribbean, or the Western uh, Tropical Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that there's a marked increase in water temperature in that part of the Atlantic. Still a uh, rise in water temperature in uh, the eastern Atlantic off the coast of Africa, but it's not nearly as pronounced as it is in the western part of the Atlantic. So if we look at temperature, uh, water temperature anomaly, we can see that in that part of the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, the water is actually warmer than average for uh, this current time. And this was uh, June 9th, so a couple of days ago on Saturday. Uh, however, the water is actually a little bit colder than average uh, just off the coast of Africa, which is what we call the main development region. So uh, the combination effect of warmer water in the west and colder water in the, um, in the east uh, results in about a 50-50 a, a contribution from water temperature. However, the water temperature anomaly I must say is a lot smaller than it was the negative anomaly. The, the colder water is not quite as cold relative to average than it was only about three weeks ago. So that water is warming up quite rapidly. But still the contribution right now is, is, is minimal in terms of above or below average. So if we look at wind shear, uh, for wind shear, we try and determine whether there's an El Nino or not. And for that, we look at water temperature in the Pacific. And if water temperature in that large rectangle is, is above average, uh, significantly above average, we call that an El Nino. And when we have an El Nino, we have uh, more wind shear in the Atlantic, meaning fewer hurricanes. So right now it's about average. So it's neither an uh, El Nino nor El La Nina, which is the opposite of El Nino. So right now the contribution for uh, for wind shear is again um, uh, pretty much uh, average. And just before I go on to what the forecasted uh, El Nino is, if we look at the the smaller rectangle off the coast of uh, Africa, again, you can see that colder water temperature. So what is the water temperature expected to be during the peak of hurricane season in that larger rectangle? If you look at, uh, uh, this is an indication of whether we'll, we are trending towards an El Nino or not. And the red bars indicate El Nino. So the, the, the key period here is uh, under ASO, so August, September, October which is the peak of hurricane season. And this is the forecast. This is the latest the forecast for El Nino, which called for about a 40% chance that we'll reach El Nino by the time we reach uh, the peak of hurricane season. So again, we expect that the contribution uh, for wind shear, we don't expect wind shear to be a big factor in keeping the numbers down but it's not uh, a favorable situation for a more active season either. So it's about, about in the middle. The last thing is the multi-decadal cycle, which is a cycle of about 20 to 40 years uh, that uh, varies between an active and less active period. Right now we're, we're considered in an active period and really until there's clear evidence indicating that we're not, we basically have to uh, assume that we are still in an active period. So if we look at all these factors together and look at what the updated outlook for the hurricane season is, this is what NOAA issued uh, just a couple of weeks ago. They were calling for 10 to 16 named storms, five to nine of those reaching hurricane status, and one to four of those hurricanes uh, reaching major hurricane status. So you can see how that compares to the average um, for these uh, for those types of storms. And overall, from a statistical point of view, the uh, forecast is for 
a 75% chance that the number of storms that we'll see in the Atlantic this year will be near to above average. So that's the predictions for this year. Uh, Colorado State, who also, also issues these forecasts, um, updated their forecast the last week and lowered their numbers a little bit from what they issued in the springtime, largely because of the cold water temperatures in the eastern part of the Atlantic. So the water temperature is going to be a critical thing that we're going to be monitoring as we head into uh, uh, the, the middle part of hurricane season. And again, these are the names that we'll be using this year. So, of course, we've already used Alberto. Uh, and the next uh, storm on the list, whenever that happens, would be Burrow, followed by Chris, Debbie, Ernesto, and so on. So that is a quick update on hurricane season, uh, where we stand and where we're going. So uh, back over to you, Mike. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bob. And we did have a couple questions that came in uh, during uh, during that. Uh, this first question is, uh, uh, does the uh, Saharan uh, dust assist or mute storm formation? Um, it's essentially, for the most part, it, it, it mutes storm formation because it, it, it kind of stabilizes the atmosphere. It creates uh, an environment where you have warm air aloft. Uh, and warm and dry air aloft, and that's not a favorable situation for hurricane development or uh, intensification. So any storms that you might get will probably not uh, mature to a very uh, strong storm. So uh, the Saharan dust uh, layer tends to keep the numbers down. Okay, and uh, another, uh, another question and a, uh, a good one just to kind of emphasize the point. And El, a strong El Nino means fewer Atlantic uh, storms, right? Yeah, strong El Nino. And so if you think back to that large uh, rectangle, whenever the, um, the average water temperature in that rectangle is more than one degree Celsius above average, it has to be more than 0.5 degrees above average to be called an El Nino. But a strong El Nino would be water temperatures over one uh, degree Celsius, and we definitely don't expect that between now and the peak of hurricane season. Okay, great. And uh, let me just check, make sure uh, we don't have any other questions uh, came in. Um, a couple more. How does the lack of Bermuda High differ from last year? Um, that varies. Um, I, I haven't seen a huge difference uh, in that up to this point of the season. Uh, we'd have to wait till we get further into the season to see if there's any kind of uh, deviations from what it was last year. But, but basically, the Bermuda high is always there. Um, it's the position and strength of the high uh, that can vary. So what impact that would have on, on hurricanes is basically if you have a strong Bermuda high, uh, the storms would tend to go straight towards the west or only recurve slightly and could have an impact on the southeastern part of the U.S. A weaker Bermuda high would allow the storms to make that turn a lot earlier and either remain out to sea or impact us here in Canada. Okay, great. And one, uh, one last one. How will uh, the hurricane season impact droughts in the U.S. and Canada? Well, one of the things about this, uh, this outlook uh, in terms of uh, the number of storms is based on those factors that I mentioned, we we're able to, to, you know, with a certain uh, degree of confidence, uh, say how many storms that we're going to get. What we're not able to do, however, at this point in the season is actually predict where these storms are going to go. So it's impossible to say, you know, if the, if any of these storms that uh, we're going to see in the Atlantic this year might have an impact on any drought uh, anywhere in the U.S. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. And uh, that's uh, we'll, we'll wrap up the questions at that point uh, so we can move on to the next one. Thanks again, and uh, we'll uh, go ahead and move to the uh, to our part of the presentation here at Lead Headquarters uh, on um, the uh, the last uh, hurricane season. Kind of an overview of what happened uh, in a response uh, 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 in the response, and then uh, Dave Isger, our, our uh, 
media and public relations manager will talk about um, the uh, uh, the real role of media and PR and getting information uh, during the response. So we'll start off with a, a quick uh, rundown of the response last season, some of those lessons learned. Um, of course, as you all know, the 2017 hurricane season was um, the strongest we've encountered in a long time uh, since uh, really about 2005 with uh, Katrina. Although 2008 and Ike uh, and and uh, Sandy also kind of uh, gave us a, a heavy response, but this one was three back-to-back -back storms. So just a quick scope of what this season looked like. The number of fatalities is still uh, still kind of up in the air. There's been figures that uh, as low as about 400 or so, and as high as uh, close to 5,000. So that number is still being determined. $282.16 billion in damages and, and $280 billion of that or so just from three storms, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, making it the costliest on record. There uh, is still ongoing recovery efforts in Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Florida, Texas, as well as throughout the Caribbean and Central uh, Mexico. And the, the thing to keep in mind from, from an amateur radio standpoint with these big storms that went back to back to back was that uh, from August 17th through October 3rd, we were in hurricane response mode in some way um, in, in the Caribbean, in the Southeast United States. And of course, we, I'll get more into the headquarters response here in a little bit. During uh, that season, there was also Jose and Katia. There was a total solar eclipse on August 21st. There was an earthquake in Mexico City and wildfires out west. So this was a, a tremendously busy uh, disaster uh, year uh, with a lot of amateur radio response. And of course, you know, the other thing that we, uh, we're seeing now is the impact of evacuees that are, uh, that are leaving uh, Puerto Rico, uh, primarily Virgin Islands and some of the other islands in the Caribbean, and that, that's creating a uh, kind of a secondary issue. So um, here at headquarters, we have the HAMAID program. Uh, many of you have heard of this. This is a cache of equipment that we, uh, we maintain here at headquarters and also at a few sites around the country. Um, this was started during Hurricane Katrina. It wasn't started after or before it was in the middle of Katrina that this really got started when equipment manufacturers wanted to donate equipment to, uh, to the response. So uh, over the years, this, this cache has been upgraded in some ways and we've, we've added, added to it, we've, we've maintained the equipment. But during that, that month, uh, late August to late September, there were 33 equipment deployments. Now, the, the trick is we didn't have 33 kits to deploy, so there was a lot of equipment added during that time. Uh, so this is the most uh, handmade deployments we have had in the history of the program. Handmade kits went to Puerto Rico, uh, actually about almost uh, 27 or so uh, went to Puerto Rico, as well as a lot of support material. Uh, kits went to the U.S. Virgin Islands, Central Florida. They went to the Florida Keys to assist uh, the Danish Red Cross with relief efforts there. And kits were recalled from Texas and Washington to help with this uh, because of the, the shortage of equipment. During the month, we had to add about $75,000 in additional equipment to the handmade inventory. So there was also a, a large fundraising effort that had to go along with that since the program is entirely donor funded. Of course, there are other costs that uh, come along with this transportation of, of equipment. Uh, it's not always provided uh, free of charge. So uh, occasionally we do have to pay for that staffing. There's a lot of overtime hours. And of course, when you send radios out into disaster zones, there are repairs to be made. During the month, we relied on several transportation sources to get these kits uh, to, uh, to various sites. Air cargo is the easiest way. Uh, that's major airlines uh, taking uh, cargo on commercial flights, uh, we did that through Southwest and JetBlue, uh, through private courier. Uh, there was a FEMA contractor who was on his way down to the Virgin Islands and we gave him two kits and said, please drop these off. And, uh, and, and he was able to do that. And then there was uh, FEMA did come through with a, uh, a transportation arrangement for us. It was a, kind of a one-time uh, only deal, but that kind of helped us out in getting uh, some, some additional equipment to the U.S. Virgin Islands, which that equipment, while it was destined for the Virgin Islands, ended up staying in Puerto Rico because that was right about that time that Irma was just getting, uh, making its way through and, and Maria was on her way. So, of course, the big thing from last season was the Red Cross request that came in. I'm going to go through this really quickly because this happened really quickly. Um, on Friday, September 22nd, I was contacted by the American Red Cross with the initial idea 
they had disaster response teams on the ground in Puerto Rico. They needed communications. Um, all communications were out and they called at 1130 on a Friday night with a simple question. How many hams can you gather in, in very short order, about uh, 48 hours? And the guess was 50. Uh, that's where the force of 50 I, uh, idea, the name came from. I wasn't sure if we could get 50, but we'd give it a try. So Saturday morning on the 23rd conference call with Red Cross officials, uh, league officials were, was, was conducted uh, to work out all the details. Um, and by Sunday, the initial call for volunteers went out. Uh, as well as call for donors because we knew that there was going to be a lot of equipment needed. By Monday morning, the call for 50 volunteers, we actually had about 550 that volunteered. Uh, and of course, we, we had a very short amount of time, something like about 36 hours to vet everybody. So it was really a matter of who, who matched the criteria first. By Monday, we turned a list of 50 names over to the Red Cross and started working on equipment because this equipment didn't exist. We had to turn in orders that were kind of overnight orders. And by Tuesday morning, the equipment was arriving. And meanwhile, the, the volunteers that were selected, 22 out of that 50 were ultimately selected to go because um, there is a cost to sending volunteers into a disaster zone. So cost is a, obviously a factor as well. So uh, the equipment started arriving here. We formed an assembly line with staff, started packing these kits out. Red Cross ran all the volunteers through the paperwork and the volunteers received their travel orders. By Wednesday, 22 volunteers, I think it was actually 21 uh, from this list, arrived in Atlanta to pick up their equipment, meet at a staging area. And then one of the local guys in Atlanta did such a good job and impressed the Red Cross that they invited him to go too. So, um, so he, he also made the team. And by Thursday, so six days after the initial idea, volunteers departed Atlanta for San Juan and were boots on the ground. So six days to go from uh, concept to implementation was uh, quite remarkable. That's not to say that it went without a hitch. Uh, there's obviously, uh, you know, there's always something that uh, doesn't go exactly as planned and you, you, those are your lessons learned. So what kind of specs did the, did the, uh, the volunteers have to meet? Now, a lot of this was set by Red Cross uh, with a little bit of input on, on our side and it was done, it had to be done very quickly. So the first thing is they went under the Red Cross banner. Once they signed on the dotted line as a volunteer, they were property of the Red Cross. Uh, the requirements, general class amateur radio license or higher with a, a primarily a familiarity with WinLink. The initial thought was that uh, safe and well data from disaster survivors could be sent by a WinLink back to Red Cross headquarters for batch processing into the system. And while that, that definitely works, we did some trial runs of it. Uh, turned out that was, uh, not as as needed as as they thought when when they actually got there. HF voice, of course, you can cover the entire island of Puerto Rico on 40 meter phone. So it, that that was definitely a, a, a skill set that they needed to have. And of course, VHF simplex because the repeaters were starting to come back online by the time they got there. Strong technical skills. Um, you you really have to have good station building skills and uh, electrical skills in, in this kind of environment. The ability to work under difficult conditions, I think this is a bit of an understatement uh, considering what some of them went through while they were there. And the ability to deploy for up to three weeks, which is about a week longer than a typical Red Cross deployment. But because of the, the logistics of this and where it was at, three weeks was the, uh, the requirement. And of course, the ability to work as part of a team. Helpful skills, Spanish speaking, which I think in hindsight, most would say that that, that could have been bumped up to a requirement. Uh, previous experience in disaster response uh, or work with the Red Cross as a volunteer or in shelter operations. So once they got there and the boots on the ground, 22 out of 50 uh, ended up going to Puerto Rico. Once they got there, they, they realized that uh, the mission had to be adapted almost immediately. There were uh, greater concerns, hospital communications, fire communications. Uh, the, the situation at the Guajataca Dam where the, the dam was uh, in danger of failing. Military was needing support. There was, there was just uh, so much demand uh, on, on, for communications that the mission had to be adopt, uh, adapted. And some of the volunteers did go with, with reunification teams out in the field to focus on the search and, uh, the safe and well uh, side of it. So amateur radio, Semper Gumby, always flexible. That had to be the motto while they were there. Over time, SHARES, which is the HF radio network that the federal government runs, uh, many of their uh, SHARES licensees are also amateur radio operators. So they started working out a scheme to get some SHARES operators to come down. 
so part of the idea became to use the 22 to to kind of get things I wouldn't say stabilized, but at least uh, provide some some communication support until local Puerto Rican amateur radio operators could could get more actively involved and and, and things could be handed over. And then the shares operators were another good bridge uh, in the meantime. And uh, the one thing that really impressed me when I was down there was the number of amateur radio operators from other organizations that we ran into, Southern Baptist Team Rubicon uh, with DMAT teams and so on. And, and the, it was really wonderful to see that uh, as you uh, ran into the amateur radio operators from these other organizations, how willing they were to pitch in and help out. So on the league side, there were, the commitment was primary, primarily equipment. Uh, so we, we provided equipment in the HF handmade kits. Uh, dual band mobiles, antennas, uh, seven generators went down. That became the, 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 the most difficult thing to get shipped down there uh, since uh, there are pretty tight restrictions on, on generators. And once they're down there, we, we have no expectation that they're going to come back because they've had fuel and oil put in them. Uh, we also uh, committed to, a, to our liaison duties with American Red Cross and FEMA primarily, but also with a lot of other organizations that were, were involved through our national VOAD network. And uh, you know, the other thing with the league is we are the amateur radio resource for the volunteers. You know, that that's something that we we provide very direct support on and, and give uh, re those resources to our volunteers and support them. And of course, support the field organization in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. There was also a lot of media and PR uh, aspects to this. I think there, during that month of August, September into October, amateur radio spent more time in the national news than almost any time since probably Katrina. So there was a, a very large media and PR component to this. And the other side to the, this is, it, this was not, the league was not part of Red Cross San Juan, operate, uh, San Juan operations. So they, they did that. We primarily worked over at the, the joint field office. And it wasn't an Aries operation in any stretch. This was really an amateur radio mission to support uh, Red Cross. So uh, in early October, um, we had a meeting and it was decided I would head down there to to basically make the emergency preparedness uh, department here at headquarters uh, available directly at the JFO. So uh, we provided direct access that way to league resources. And of course, with all that equipment, some inventory management just takes that responsibility off off others and and provide some assistance to the to Oscar Resto, the uh, section manager there in Puerto Rico. So I spent most of my time as liaison function there at the uh, the JFO, uh, the, the, the main EOC in San Juan. Now, an interesting media and PR piece to all of this is when I got there, there was a, a large area that was set up for, for the media. But what was noticeable was that a lot of the, the big name media disappeared at one point. And it, it's something we, we forget is when a bigger story comes along, uh, the story that we're, we find ourselves in isn't newsworthy anymore. And it wasn't too long after I got there was when the Las Vegas shooting happened and a lot of the media pulled out at that point. So primarily I was in San Juan and did site visits to the Guadataca Dam where uh, Andy Anderson, uh, now KP4AAN, was uh, located at. And then Oscar and I went out to uh, check out a repeater site in Calus, uh, uh just outside of San Juan. So that was that was my role there. Uh, just some a uh, little bit of a, a picture uh, uh, tour of, of the area. So the sites that our volunteers were at, hospitals, uh, like the one on the upper left, fire stations, bomberos um, throughout the island. And what was really unique is the, the chief of the fire services on the island, uh, because of the, the value that the amateur radio operators played, offered safe haven to all amateur radio operators at the fire stations. They could come in, get a meal, get water. Uh, rest, uh, set up a radio if they needed to. So it, it was um, it, it was really appreciated the role the fire department and fire services uh, played in helping the amateur radio response out. Um, of course, Red Cross headquarters there in San Juan. Uh, there's, um, uh, uh, I remember it was Father Ortiz. It was that was his email, uh, and and um, uh, Joe Bassett there. Uh, operating net control uh, K1, uh, yeah, it was K1M at uh, Red Cross headquarters, and then there's the, the uh, on the bottom right is the joint field office where the EOC, the primary EOC, was at. And uh, of course, our number one job, communication support. We provided support for military, federal, and non-government partners, safe and well messaging, resource requests, medical evacuations, and of course, technical support. Uh, our, the volunteers were, were quite busy in a wide range of communications activities in support of 
it was just amazing how many folks really saw the value of amateur radio um, uh, during that response. So daily life, uh, lodging uh, in the upper left, that was the FEMA Hilton there at the, in the basement of the joint field office. So that's where you could bunk with 200 of your closest friends. Uh, when they first got there though, the upper right was where they were sleeping. It was church pews. Uh, so they were using the Red Cross blankets as pillows. Um, one volunteer commented that that was the most time they had spent in church in a long time. Uh, bottom left, another reality was lines. There was always, everywhere you went initially, it was lined for something, food, water, gasoline. And um, of course the weather, one thing about uh, in Puerto Rico is it rains every afternoon. It seems like clockwork. So that added to some of the problems that you could encounter, especially in transportation. And of course, wildlife was something that we got to encounter quite a bit of with iguanas and snakes and, and bats and so on. Um, transportation was always a bit of an issue. Uh, what was there one day might not be there the next day. And uh, fuel, which was initially scarce, became more and more available as time went on. And I, I will not forget uh, Oscar, KP4RF, the, the section manager there saying, I love hurricanes. And it was because of uh, hurricanes knock out all the traffic lights, it makes it easier to get around San Juan. So structural damage, of course, everywhere, uh, buildings, infrastructure, the Guadataca Dam, airports and seaports, all heavily uh, affected. Um, so who were the people that went, the, the volunteers? They came from 17 states, age range roughly 19 to about 72, uh, came from a wide range of backgrounds, military, law enforcement, clergy, accounting, fire services, and so on. And of course, the locals cannot underestimate the role that the, the local amateur radio operators in Puerto Rico played in response to uh, a disaster that, that had a direct impact on, on their lives as well. So a lot of lessons learned uh, from the response uh, from the handmade kit side. We're reevaluating what, what is in the kits because we got a lot of good feedback from the volunteers that used them. We're also looking at new, uh, new plans on transportation of those kits. Uh, a lot of times uh, in the past, we, we've had to if air cargo wasn't available, which is the easiest route, it was kind of a, a, you know, quickly try to put something together. So we formed some new uh, partnerships that will make transportation easy. Of course, use of the ICS-205 form. This is really important when you're using uh, primarily HF because that's something a lead can do is help make those frequencies known so avoid some interference. But that ICS-205 is really critical when you got volunteers coming in uh, that may not know uh, the repeaters and, and simplex frequencies that are often used. Lack of PIOs, that was something that really stood out throughout the entire season. We need more PIOs. I, I cannot stress that enough. Your, your, the, the partners you work with, Emergency Management, Red Cross, and so on, they've got PIOs, but it's not their job to tell the amateur radio story. They may occasionally, uh, lack of a better term, throw you a bone and tell, you that, tell, tell that story in a press briefing, but that's why you have to have good amateur radio PIOs so that the amateur radio story definitely gets out there. Um, message priority, that was something that was really clear. Uh, there was a lot of talk about, can we get a message? Can we do health and welfare traffic? We, we've kind of moved past health and welfare traffic. That's that safe and well system. So it really came life-saving first, outbound second, and then only if needed inbound traffic. So we, we really have to be aware of that. And we also have to make a, a better effort to get that information into systems like Red Cross Safe and Well, because that's where folk, folks can check on uh, status of loved ones. W1AW, this is one of the first times they suspended bulletins uh, to assist during a disaster. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was a key part. Uh, information sharing, that is something that a lot of us are looking at now and how to get real-time amateur radio information uh, out there. Uh, the cooperative arrangement with Red Cross, while it worked well, it had some shortcomings as well. So we're, we're looking at, at that uh, a little closer. The final after action report is available. Uh, it is on the website. If you go to arrl.org slash ARIES, look for the uh, monthly reports uh, uh, button, click on that and you'll see special reports down below. And of course, vetting of volunteers. Uh, we learned a lot about the, this uh, during the response and we were already looking at ways to implement some changes as to how that's gonna happen in the future. So that is the quick and uh, reasonably quick and fast rundown of the response during the 2017 uh, hurricane season. Uh, the lessons that we learned from that are definitely gonna uh, drive how we respond in, in this and upcoming seasons. So um, we're, we're gonna, it'll be a little bit before we get to questions because we're gonna go right into the, to the uh, PR uh, and uh, the media and PR 
component of uh, this part of the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave Isker and one RSN to uh, to discuss the media and PR piece of hurricane response. Uh, Dave, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, and, and you led in perfectly to what um, we're going to talk about here. Um, I think the you pointed out the need for PIOs and how critical that was, and I think that may raise the first question for everybody is why PIOs? What is that value? Um, it makes me think back to the uh, the line from the Jerry Maguire movie, which is, help me help you. Let me help you. Um, and that's what PIOs can do for you. Um, a lot of the information I'm going to um, talk about tonight is from a perspective of what the PIO will do. But the first thing um, and the most important job that a PIO does is he's your he or she is your buffer. Um, they can handle the response and the answering questions and giving information to the media so that that makes you uh, allows you to do the job that you are there to do, which is provide emergency communications. So how do we help the PIOs um, and people like myself do the best job we can do for a, an organization? And that's if you provide timely um, information on a real-time basis to your PIO, a one-time communication to the PIO can then get that information out and handle all the different and varied media requests that are coming in so that they don't keep bumping that back and forth to you. Um, but to, to, for a PIO to do their job, they need the information on a timely basis, um, and that allows us to be effective and, uh, and efficient in what we do. And remember, one last thing I'll just say, it's important, I, I've got it up there on the slide. The goal here is not to seek publicity. We're not glory hounds in what we do. We know that you're there to do a mission. What we're trying to do is just uh, remind people of what the value of amateur radio is in these emergency situations, what the role of uh, emergency communication is. So let's talk next about the types of information that we need um, and whether we set this up on a schedule or how this goes. Um, um, you can work that out with your PIO. Um, but the types of information, it's basically the five W's of what makes journalism run. The who, what, when, where, why of a situation. So the information, what is happening, where, who's involved, when, why is it occurring? And the, you know, be as succinct and brief in answering those questions. But the more we have that information, the more we can provide that to the media and that gives them the information. Um, we love using um, photos. You, everybody knows photos and videos are, are can tell the story as quickly and as easily and, and many times better than we can do it verbally. Um, but to do that, those pictures and videos need to answer the five W's as well. We need the information of who is in the photo, um, what are they doing, um, where is it taken, who um, and how, uh, you know, so um, all of those um, need to be provided when we when we do this. I will say it's important. We, we love getting photos and videos. We want to remind you to be safe when you're doing that. We don't want anybody putting themselves in harm's way to get a photo or a video. And we know that this is not your first job um, of what to do. But, you know, if, if you can safely um, do that, then we, we really appreciate that. So here's the question we get asked most often by people. What constitutes newsworthy information? We keep saying, well, it has to be newsworthy. We want it to be newsworthy. Well, what does that mean? Um, it's really easy to answer, I think, because all of us watch the news. We see the types of information that's on there, the stories that they cover, what they're looking for, whether it's human interest or whether it's, you know, it needs to be dramatic, it needs to be significant, and if it's unusual, that sometimes helps too. Um, but, you know, again, we all have developed a certain amount of new sense, even those who are, who are out in the field, because you know, um, because you're watchers and, and readers of news anyway, so you know what is significant and, uh, and unusual. Um, on a factual basis, you know, whatever factual information you can provide in terms of 
damage, injuries, um, if there are fatalities. A lot of times that's not your responsibility. Um, so, you know, let's make sure that, um, you know, again, in all these situations, we, we are working with served agencies. So many times that's up to uh, law enforcement or others that are, um, that are the incident commanders for the situation. Um, and again, that's also important to remember that we're not providing information that we don't know to be factually accurate. Um, we never want to be passing along information that, that is unverified or just what we thought. Um, so then the, the question becomes, who do we send the information to? Um, so that's on the next slide. Um, it's really important. Um, I, the first thing in answering this is you should know who your, the PIO in your area is, um, who your organization or group's PIO is. If you don't, get to know that person, find out who that is. So when you are deployed, that person um, should be aware, made aware and, and be brought into the situation immediately. Um, at the, if that's not possible, you can obviously contact um, the Media and Public Relations Department here at ARRL HQ. We're happy to, to act as a conduit to funnel that information or to be here um, if you're if you don't have a PIO in your group or you need to provide that information and we provided a list of um, of who the main people are there's myself as the communications the public relations uh, manager uh, Michelle Patno who is uh, my assistant here and and is literally uh, the the person who is responsible for our social media feeds and 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 manages those Rick Lindquist does the, uh, the ARRL news webpage, and, and many of you have relations, uh, relationships with him already and, um, and providing him with information. He does a, a tremendous job in that. So, um, so those are the, the folks. Our, our contact information will be available for you. Um, and then where do, we, where do the information you give us, where does that go? Um, we, we are first and foremost a resource to national media. Your PIOs are resources to your local and regional media outlets. So that's the main place we're providing the information that you give us. We're sorting through it, organizing it, developing it, and providing it to the news media, which, as I said, allows you to do the job that you are primarily there to do and keep you free. Um, that information that comes in, we also do post it on a number of places. Uh, some of it is places where media does pick it up. A lot of media follows our Twitter feed. They follow our Facebook feeds so that they're getting that information that we're posting there um, and then contacting us about it. So um, that information works. It also is, allows us to share it um, with all of our members and with, with people in the general public directly. So we have um, a variety of social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and YouTube, uh, for example, which is where this uh, this will uh, this will be later. Um, and then, if you're just interested in seeing the things that we posted, obviously you can look at our social media feeds. Whatever media hits uh, we get, we we're posting them on our website, uh, arrl.org/media-hits. Um, you can go there and see the stories. Um, in fact, if you go back, we still have the, uh, the many of the stories, uh, news, audio, video that were done during the uh, during the hurricane season of 2017. We'll be setting that up uh, for this coming season and providing storm-specific uh, media hits pages as we did last year with. Um, with Maria and Irma and Harvey. So um, I think that covers all the information that I wanted to get out. So I will get, hand it back over to Mike. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, yep. Get the audio back. Okay. Uh, we'll try to get to some of the questions. Uh, there's probably quite a few because we, we had to take a little bit of a break from, uh, from uh, the question screen. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look. Uh, so a question came up. Uh, uh, so in the past, the league has refrained from sending amateurs 
could this be a first step in creating an organized method um, of having an Aries map type team for the future? Well, one thing we are exploring is the, uh, the possibility of a national response team. That's still kind of in consideration, but I think uh, we're, we're leaning in that direction. And that uh, would not quite be an Aries map, I mean, sort of, uh, sort of that concept. But uh, one of the things that we're looking at with that is amateurs that bring nothing but the best skill sets, not just amateur radio skill sets, but you know, that, that full, uh, full complement of skill sets, the disaster response, you know, working in a team environment, the right personality type, you know, because there, there are some ways to kind of uh, focus on that as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that is something we're considering. Um, another question, um, were there hams on the mainland or elsewhere that were uh, in indirect part of the response by HF, absolutely. In fact, there were there were uh, just kind of a, a countless number of them. Uh, there was a, an impromptu um, an impromptu net that uh, uh, started up about five kilohertz above the Saturn net, which was also doing a lot of uh, uh, hurricane related traffic. So there were quite a few that were um, uh, helping out uh, indirectly, uh, either through HF traffic nets. Um, on uh, on Winlink and, and so on. So yeah, there were quite a few, uh, quite a few there. Um, uh, the uh, as far as the URL to the after action report, we will. Uh, I'll I'll see if we can share that uh, here. Uh, I'll blast that out to everybody. Uh, the link to it uh, here shortly. Um, Okay, so we've got to, we're kind of moving into some questions for Dave. Will public information officers receive advanced training how to serve, like how to serve in a joint information center? There's there currently is training available. Uh, there's a, a course on the uh, ARRL uh, Media and Public Relations website um, that is P, called PR 101 for that. I also recommend the the uh, FEMA um, has a PIO course uh, on its site that's very good for uh, for that that's more um, uh, the ARRL PIO course is very broad in terms of uh, covering public relations so it does it is helpful and it's valuable um, we're actually in the process of, of updating and uh, and modernizing that to some extent but um, I think also there's other um, like I said, the FEMA uh, PIO course is very good as well. Yeah, we're we're taking a look at a lot at a lot of our training uh, and and doing some some updating and modernization. So yeah, look for more information uh, probably coming out in the in the next uh, I don't know probably in the coming months uh, yeah. on on some new training. Did have a question about uh, health and welfare traffic. Um, you know, I think uh, the one lesson that we really got out of this is, uh, you know, the world has changed. We, we just have to we have to face that reality. And, you know, with things like Facebook safety check, um, you know, even during the 2010 uh, Haiti earthquake, Twitter was being used to to blast uh, kind of I'm OK messages out. Um, Red Cross safe and well uh, being one of these systems. We're really going to have to rethink what we how we approach the the idea of health and health and welfare traffic. Uh, it's really become that safe and well traffic, and uh, uh, so I think we're we're going to have to get give some serious thought to where our role is in this new environment of safety messaging. Um, it it it's changed. We you know we're seeing in so many ways. You know our our, our need to 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 uh, get adjusted to a 21st century uh, approach to communications because it's far different than you know when, when our service started. So um, you know I think that's that's one of those areas we're gonna have to take a closer look at. Okay, we need to move along. We're 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 staying reasonably on time, and I want to turn this uh, next over to uh, Julio Rapol, WD4R from the. Uh, National Hurricane Center's uh, amateur radio uh, WX4NHC. So, uh, Julio, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. All right. Um, give me just one second, and you have the controls, so uh, the show is yours. Very good. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for attending the ARRL's uh, hurricane webinar this year. My name's Julio Rapol. My call sign is Whiskey Delta 4 Romeo, and I'm the Amateur Radio Assistant Coordinator at the National Hurricane Center. And let's see, there we go. So a few years ago, we had a very quiet Atlantic. Everybody was very comfortable with that. 
But as Bob uh, from the Canadian Hurricane Center explained, uh, this year's outlook is not as active as last year's, but it's still going to be a very active year. So everybody needs to be aware and everybody needs to be prepared. So you should have a plan and start early and be prepared and don't wait till the shelves are bare. It happens in Miami almost every year. So hire your best helper to put up your shutters. Don't forget to protect your car and of course, buy plenty of spam. You're gonna need it after uh, all the stores shelves are bare. And when the local authorities say you have to evacuate, carefully follow the local evacuation orders. Anyway, enough of the fun stuff. Now for the serious stuff, yeah, last year was one of the most active hurricane seasons on record. We had 17 tropical cyclones, 10 became hurricanes, and six reached major hurricane strength. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, of course, had epic flooding in Texas, especially the Corpus Christi and Houston area. Uh, Hurricane Maria uh, might cover very well all the activity that happened uh, during Hurricane uh, Maria there. Uh, with the amateur radio operators serving that area, both uh, in Puerto Rico and, of course, in St. Croix as well. Both islands suffered major structural damage and power outages that lasted for months. And we're extremely proud of uh, both Oscar and Fred. Fred, K9 uh, Victor Victor, was one of our uh, WX4NHC hurricane operators here in Miami for many years before he moved to St. Croix. So congratulations, Fred. So I'm going to give you a little personal perspective with Hurricane Irma since it hit my uh, area uh, very strongly. And uh, everyone in the Caribbean and Florida watched it with uh, intense uh, focus and frantically prepared their homes and businesses um, you know, as best they could for this monster hurricane, which back basically had one of the strongest uh, readings in the Atlantic in history. Uh, I was lucky. Uh, I had uh, a lockdown operator at the Hurricane Center to ride out the storm. And I, after going through Hurricane Andrew in 1992, uh, I was not going to stay at home because my house was basically destroyed in, uh, with Hurricane Andrew and we rebuilt it which took almost a year. And this one was predicted to be a hurricane five when it hit uh, South Florida. So fortunately, uh, since I work at the University of Miami, they said, come on in and you'll be part of the command center for Baskin Palmer Eye Institute and to communicate with the um, central power plant building, which controls the entire campus. And we had a ham radio operator there as well. So when their communications went down, I was able to speak directly to the person at the central energy plant where they had five gigantic generators powering the entire campus. And this is the anemometer, which is on top of one of our 15-story uh, buildings, and it measured a peak gust of 133 miles per hour. And this was the entire uh, team at the command center there, including uh, the, the chairmans and, and several of the people in charge there and the dean as well. And we even took time out during this hurricane on the day that it hit to give these children uh, a birthday party. And that's the chairman of Baskin Palmer there, which I don't know how he did it, but he found some cupcakes and was able to help them celebrate their, their birthday there. So back at home, when I got back, I found that uh, all my trees were gone or they all fell down, my fence was gone. And uh, I had inherited a satellite dish uh, that I didn't have before, <laughs> it struck the middle of my roof and went through. And we lived under a tarp for five months until we got a new roof put on. Uh, the Hurricane Center did well. It's a hurricane-proof building. Of course, uh, we lost two antennas, uh, one being a vertical HF antenna. We have uh, two redundant backups for that. And we found two uh, very handy hams to go back and put it back together. So basically who we are and what we do. Well, we moved into this hurricane center from the one we were before um, since the beginning on US-1, which was a high-rise building. Uh, this building was built in 1995. 
the walls were all 10 inch thick steel reinforced concrete walls and the bathrooms are 20 inch thick and can withstand an EF5 tornado. And we moved in 1995, which at that time was the busiest hurricane season with 18 named storms. And in the middle of all that, we pulled 300 feet of coax cable and put up seven antennas and we're in business. Uh, the first radio used at the Hurricane Center was the Yezu FT-101, and I would bring that from the UM dorm, walk across US-1, also known as Dixie Highway, in a cardboard box and set it up on a, a forecaster's desk. Well, Yezu kept the tradition. They have donated all our radios ever since, and a few years ago, they donated this FT-1200 that runs with an amp at about 600 watts. They also donated the uh, BHF, UHF radios that we use for local communications, including coordinating with the EOCs, and also the SARnet. We have Florida has a network of about, I think, 26 to 28 repeaters that stretch from the Keys all the way up to the Capitol in Tallahassee, and we can connect them all. In fact, our repeater at the Hurricane Center is connected to that network, and we were able to talk to all the EOCs all the way up and down Florida uh, should we have to during a hurricane. We also have digital modes, Echolink, IRLP, Winlink, HFM, VHF, APRS, and of course email. And all of our equipment was donated by private companies. We did not ask the government for any funds at all. We have approximately 30 operators and they go through special training and background checks, of course, to operate at the hurricane center. And these are just a few that helped during uh, Hurricane uh, Maria and Her Irma. Uh, Armando KG4LYD is also with the Red Cross. Uh, Mike KG4YDX is a director with the UM at Baskin Palmer. And this lovely couple here, Susie WX2L and Alan WE4L, are retired music teachers and currently television actors. And we see them almost every night on our commercials locally here. So we welcome our new director, Kenneth Graham. And uh, Ken is a fantastic person. Uh, and not only is he gonna be a great director because of his incredible resume and leadership at New Orleans uh, NWS, but he also happens to be a ham radio operator. His call sign is WX4KEG or weather for Ken E. Graham. And he took time uh, when we did our annual station test on Saturday a few weeks ago. And um, just a really fantastic guy. I mean, I have a great feeling that Hammerter Radio's gonna be at the Hurricane Center for a long time. So how can ham radio operators help during hurricane season? Well, quickly through our uh, purpose and goals, collect weather data, surface reports from the hurricane affected areas in real time for use by the hurricane forecasters. So you don't know, have to be inside the hurricane to send us a report you can be very important relay stations because many times we don't hear the stations in the Caribbean or the Gulf Coast, and you become the relay that gives us that information. Provide backup emergency communications to and from the Hurricane Center during or after a direct hit, and that has happened several times. We get hit locally here. Sometimes other forms of communications go out, and then we use ham radio as our backup. Provide hurricane advisories over ham radio whenever sources are not available in the affected area. This has happened many times before when there's a ham like uh, we had a few years ago in the Yucatan in a small fishing village. He did not have any other for source of information except through 20 meters on ham radio. He took down the advisories and he relayed it to the local AM broadcast station, which is the only communications all the villagers had on their small AM uh, radios and to enhance and promote the accuracy and availability of weather data surface reports. Basically, we would love if all of you have a weather station can give us some measured reports. And our main mission, to help save lives. So how can you get in touch with us? Many ways, we try to open up communications as wide as possible. We can't be everywhere at one time, so we use nets. And the nets, uh, 20 meters, a hurricane watch net, the VYP echo link, IRLP nets, VHF, UHF nets. I mean, there's many different ways that the information is funneled to us. And then we get it, print it, 
and give it to the hurricane forecasters. There, the, there's a list on our website, and I won't read it all, but uh, of different ways you can get in touch with us. Uh, we're also experimenting with D-Star and D-Rats. We don't have that equipment at our station because we don't have antenna space or operators to handle the multitude of modes and frequencies that we could have. So uh, we use a, um, a person that uh, conducts the severe weather net on D-Star, and he relays on a special form all the data he collects. Of course, uh, since the, our very beginning, we began in 1980, the Hurricane Watch Net had begun in 1965, and it's led by uh, Bobby Graves, KB5HAV from Mississippi, and they relay all our HF communications to the islands and the U.S. Um, on 14,325 megahertz, and also on 40 meters when propagation goes out on 20, we'd go down to 40 on usually 7,268, and sometimes when we have a local hit and we have to go to the Bahamas or something like that, we'll go down uh, to 80 meters. Our digital communications, uh, the VOIP Hurricane Net, uh, Echolink, and, uh, which combines Echolink, uh, IRLP, DMR, several other digital modes, is a fantastic central conference that puts everything together there. They conduct the net so that we don't have to personally be there continuously. We do check in, and they do send us all their uh, reports digitally to us, and we print them out, review them, and submit them to the hurricane forecasters. And we have other methods, uh, for example, the AR, uh, APRS weather net, uh, where people who are hams and people who are not hams can apply to this, and their weather station will beak out information, and we would get that through the uh, uh, NOAA Mesonet website and other modes. Uh, so hurricane surface reports, here's some examples and forms used at WX4NHC. And this one is online, and uh, whether you're a ham or not a ham, and but you have a weather station, or even if you have an estimated report, you can go out there, fill in the form. As soon as you hit send, it prints out at our station. We review them. We always review them because we've had, sometimes we catch typos, sometimes we catch errors because their barometric uh, pressure is not calibrated at sea level and it looks wrong. <laughs> um, and, and then we submit them to uh, the main room. By the way, our radio room is right across the hall from the main hurricane center where you see all of the hurricane forecasters gathered uh, during their presentations. Uh, this is our written form, and when we get, uh, you know, voice re uh, reports uh, uh, over 20 meters or even VOIP, we would fill this out. And this is the form you can download and print as a good checklist because it has the order that the hurricane forecasters are used to looking at, and that way they can go from top to bottom and know everything where it's supposed to be. And I had mentioned uh, uh, D Star and D Rats. Uh, John Davis, WB4QDX, has been our liaison, and uh, he was excellent uh, relaying a bunch of reports in the past. And we hope that continues because we we can't be on D Star directly, but we really would like to have their information as well. So, can ham radio make a difference? You betcha. Uh, I'll go real quickly through a bunch of these because there's many many examples. Our first hurricane ever, Hurricane Allen, 1980. Uh, ham radio was the only thing left standing in that island after Category 5 Hurricane Allen went through and wiped them out. A ham made from that island, uh, his name was uh, Victor, J69DJ, connected to us here, and we were able to relay to a British hospital ship, the HMS Glasgow, which is nearby, but needed permission from their government. And that ham got the prime minister on ham radio to give that British um, hospital ship permission directly to, to uh, land on the island. And then a week later, uh, Hurricane Allen hit Brownsville as a major hurricane, and they had lost all communications from the NWS in Brownsville to the hurricane center. But Dr. Neil Frank spoke directly to their director via ham radio during landfall. So that basically set ham radio at the Hurricane Center there. As long as we can manage it, we're going to be there forever. Uh, and then, of course, 1992, that one we call the big one. That is a milestone uh, 
in time for anyone who lived through it here in South Florida. Um, Hurricane Andrew destroyed 300,000 homes. Um, we were basically out of electricity for weeks. Um, I mean, gasoline, the no, almost no uh, gas stations had generators at that time. Um, it was a disaster of all means. But we had over 200 ham radio operators came from all over the country, came down here to assist with communications between the military, the local uh, police and fire rescue. We even had uh, hams on helicopters um, communicating back down because a lot of those agencies and different branches of the military could not talk to each other on the same frequency or on the same mode. And we were the the common link to all of them there. So that that's something that uh, we look at that experience and that really taught us a lot. Another uh, way that the ham radio uh, made a difference, uh, Hurricane George, uh, one of the uh, hurricane forecasters came into our radio room, says, I need a report from the most eastern part of Cuba. I'm like, well, it's not like a telephone, you can dial a phone number. So, but we had special permission of uh, from the powers above, from the FCC and all that on an emergency to be able to go on the civil defense frequencies for Cuba, and we asked. And there was a ham in Punto Esto, Cuba, which came back and basically gave his wind report and most importantly the wind direction, because knowing where he was geographically, the hurricane forecaster then was able to calculate where the eye was in uh, in relation to his location, and they corrected the path of the hurricane, and that increased our accuracy quite a bit. And then there was Hurricane Michelle, and here again, we had hurricane, uh, we had ham radio reports from a ham in Cuba who was actually relaying military coordinates of the eye as it went over the their island, Isle of Youth, and then Cuba, and then followed up by a sailboat, which is in the Bahamas. And we were about to let go of the hurricane reports because on satellite shot, the eye had opened up on the south part portion, which indicate it was weakening. However, the momentum and the mass of the wind was still going at 100 to 110 miles per hour. And this sailboat was relaying those reports using a commercial anemometer. So uh, Max Mayfield actually got on the air and spoke with him and to make sure <laughs> that he was reading the reports. And they lifted... They, they reinstated the hurricane warnings in the Bahamas because of the hand radio reports from that sailboat. And we get recognition every once in a while and uh, amateur radio. This is from Hurricane Ivan by Stacy Stewart, who is still one of the lead forecasters at the Hurricane Center. Uh, amateur radio ham operators throughout the Caribbean region and those working as part of the Hurricane Centers, wx hc and the Hurricane WatchNet were indispensable in providing critical reports as Ivan moved through the Windward Islands and across the Caribbean Sea. So all those reports that you call in or you relay from another station, those are very important because those are things we don't see from a satellite or from an airplane. And we have to mention Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I mean, this is major hurricane hit there. It killed 1,833 people, mainly due to the flooding, and cost about $108 billion in damage. And one of the things that Ham Radio did there, there were the links to many, many different areas and agencies where there was no other communications. And what we had done was we had stayed on the air, and then there was a station in Slidell NWS which they had lost all communications, like Charles, NWS, and Slidell, they, we couldn't communicate with them. They had a ham at Slidell, and he came on the air. And for six hours, the only information in and out of Slidell and the, to the Hurricane Center was through ham radio. And even after the hurricane had passed over them, we stayed with them so that they could communicate back to their families and tell them that they were okay. So it's been 38 years now. Uh, we've done, we're, well, we're actually up to our 10th Hurricane Center director. And uh, we appreciate the continuous welcome that the Hurricane Center has extended to Amateur Radio and, uh, and the support they have given Amateur Radio for so many years. 
And so why do we want volunteer? Well, we volunteer many hours of our time, take off work, take off family time, uh, because we like to help. We like to use our skills, which are very unique, to help others. And that's why all of you are attending this webinar tonight. And uh, we really appreciate your caring about this and taking your time to listen to our presentation uh, because you can help us tremendously just listening, just being out there and being able to relay those valuable reports to us. So here again, another year has gone by and we really appreciate all the help that countless of people throughout the country and throughout the world has done uh, during hurricane season. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you, Julio. And uh, I think we had, um, we had one question uh, for you. The, um, uh, the abbreviation SAA and how to contact uh, the Hurricane Center, what does that stand for? SAA is a station that's in the affected area. Okay. Okay, and that answers that question. All right, uh, thank you. And um, we will move right along because we didn't we didn't get a whole lot of questions there, so we will be able to move right on to our next presenter, which is um, Rob Macedo from VOIP Hurricane Net. Uh, so, Rob, you there? Yes, we're here, Mike. Good evening, and good evening to all on the webinar. Okay, and control should be over to you. Okay, and. Uh... Our screen should be up here, and we'll get started. So uh, I'm going to give uh, an overview of the VOIP Hurricane Net, what we were able to do uh, uh, last year in the hurricane uh, response, and plans here for the new 2008 uh, season. Before we, uh, before we go there, though, we want to uh, uh, give a tribute, uh, quick tribute to uh, a member of our net who has been uh, – He's done a fantastic job for us, and sadly, he became a silent key on May 22nd, and that is N0UAM Jim Sellers. He was very active with the Skywarn program uh, in southwest Missouri. He's also a storm chaser, and uh, when his health uh, deteriorated over the last uh, several years, he has been a huge contributor to our VOIP hurricane net and a tremendous supporter of WX4NHC. He pulled uh, tremendous hours, including last year when his health was was probably uh, really starting to fail him. He was still available and supporting uh, our net uh, with some very long shifts during some of the uh, most uh, significant landfalls of some of these historic hurricanes during Irma and uh, Maria. And we couldn't have uh, done those activations without him. He's a significant loss to our team and to the Southwest Missouri Skywarn program. There are a number of links uh, uh, that uh, speak to his life, including his uh, self-written obituary. And uh, we also did a last call for him during the WX4 NHC communications test uh, when the Hurricane Center was on Echo Link and IRLP. So uh, we're sorry to uh, lose Jim, a terrific person, and uh, we are gonna dedicate our efforts for the 2018 season to Jim and everything that he's done, both for his local regional Skywarn program and for the VOIP Hurricane Net. So with that, uh, let's talk again, the Hurricane uh, VOIP Hurricane Net mission. Uh, you've heard this in, in other webinars, so I'll, I'll hit the high points here quickly, where our job is mainly to support WX4NHC, the National Hurricane Center in Miami, and any other agencies that would find surface reports and damage report information uh, during landfalling hurricanes helpful. We use the same reporting criteria as uh, done uh, in Skywarn programs across the country. And uh, we're trying to connect up uh, the Hurricane Center with stations in the affected area, also any of the EOCs or non-governmental organizations or other weather service offices uh, through our system uh, and one combined net. Uh, we do have um, backup systems if our main system, the Echolink Star WX underscore talk conference node 7203 IRLP reflector 9219 system goes down. So we have a number of different ways uh, uh, to communicate using a similar linked uh, system. Our activation policy is we uh, will activate upon uh, activation of WX4NHC, provided they're either Echolink or IRLP nodes or stations in the area or any other means that we can gather information in the affected area of the hurricane. Uh, we have used uh, various forms of social media 
uh, forms of, of the different Storm Blogger websites, such as stormkrib.com. Any way we can facilitate information flow, verify the information, and send it into uh, the amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center, uh, that is our, our main mission. Uh, we will self-activate if we get into a scenario where a, a threat uh, from a, a hurricane uh, becomes sudden. Uh, that happened in the mid-2000s with Hurricane Emily in 2005. Or if there's a really strong tropical storm that may get to hurricane uh, thresholds, we may uh, activate our system in, in, in that scenario as well. And we will activate our net if any other agency uh, or amateur radio group uh, or a weather service office, uh, the system is available at all times uh, to be able to be utilized for local and regional Skywarn operations uh, as needed. Uh, we have a net management team that watches uh, the tropics in the Atlantic and Pacific uh, closely, the different tropical weather outlooks, special tropical disturbance statements and such uh, uh, that are issued. Uh, there, as storms get close to uh, land areas and have the potential to become hurricanes, we'll coordinate with the National Hurricane Center uh, amateur radio coordinators on activation plans. Talked about self-activation if a system unexpectedly in intensifies. Uh, we use a telegram uh, network or the telegram app uh, to uh, communicate uh, across our uh, net management and net controls. Uh, that's available as a mobile phone app or even a PC desktop uh, uh, application. Uh, and we uh, prepare uh, uh, each off season uh, to get more stations along the coasts of the U.S., uh, the Caribbean islands, all of the uh, coastal areas are always interested in contacts in Mexico, Central America, all across the Atlantic uh, region. And uh, when possible, the Pacific region that is uh, close to uh, uh, impacting her, uh, from hurricanes. We are looking for stations in those areas during net activations. We have a VOIP hurricane prep net that is every Saturday evening. It's weekly on Saturday evenings here because we are in hurricane uh, season months of June through November. Uh, from December through May, we meet on a monthly basis. Uh, we use 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central time, except for that first net in December where we back it up an hour to uh, close out Skywarn Recognition Day uh, events uh, for that day. It's a forum to provide technical questions. Uh, we do a question of the week uh, on pretty much every net and occasionally have training uh, topic presentations. Uh, nets for activations are quite a bit different from our regular uh, hurricane prep net, but it's a great way to get some practice. And our website is voipwx.net. Talking a little bit about uh, what did we do in this past uh, hurricane season. Well, first of all, Hurricane Harvey happened to be the first landfalling major hurricane to hit the U.S. since Wilma in 2005. Uh, we were able to field a number of weather station reports with wind gusts well over 100 miles an hour including 117 miles per hour in Rockport, Texas, and 112 miles per hour in Tivoli, Texas, near the landfall point. Harvey was really three disasters in one. It was actually the, the landfalling hurricane uh, on that uh, Friday evening in August. Then uh, it uh, transitioned into major flooding in the Houston area with over 50 inches of rain. And then a third round of over 50 inches of rain out in the Beaumont, Port Arthur, Graves, Texas area. So our net had to be a bit more nimble, even though the hurricane had weakened to a tropical storm by uh, the weekend. We actually kept them a monitoring and listening watch for several days as the flooding uh, uh, came through. We actually handled some flooding information and rainfall information for local and regional National Weather Service offices uh, that were later used in statements and for the historical record. And we even handled a few... Um, uh, boat rescue calls um, getting through to the Coast Guard through some connections that our PIO, Lloyd Colston, KC5FM had with Humanity Road. Uh, it wasn't the main mission. It was only a handful of calls, but uh, we did handle a few of those Coast Guard calls through our net. And uh, again, the surface reporting, the flooding information, uh, and obviously the wind damage when the hurricane first made landfall, those surface reports were critical for the Hurricane Center and other agencies. That brings us to Hurricane Irma over the Caribbean islands. Uh, you can see some of the damage photos here. Uh, wind gust as high as 155 miles per hour on Barbuda Island before the, uh, uh, the wind instrument was uh, destroyed. Uh, category 1 hurricane damage was logged in parts of Antigua, but Barbuda was completely wiped out, the entire island having to be evacuated. 
Uh, this, uh, Irma then made its closest path uh, towards St. Martin and Anguilla with uh, many roofs and buildings severely damaged. A couple of the photos that are here uh, were actually some of the first photos that came from amateur radio operators who were able to get in contact with family before cell service uh, went down. These were some of the first damage photos uh, that we uh, sent into the Hurricane Center. They were put out over social media and uh, they were you know, very graphic reports that hopefully will help help the recovery efforts uh, once uh, Irma had passed through. There was even an, a, a weather station at the Aguila Department of Disaster Management which had a wind gust to 117 miles per hour before instrument failure and another rest station on St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands with 113 miles per hour before instrument failure. And this definitely was a hurricane season where I can't remember uh, how, many, how many times we had wind instruments failing uh, uh, the personal weather station type instruments from Davis and such, just because of the tremendous strength of the winds from these hurricanes. As Julio Rapol pointed out, there was a 133 mile per hour wind gust out in uh, Miami in one of the uh, buildings uh, there at the uh, University of Miami, as uh, Julio pointed out, uh, wind gusts over 100 miles per hour in the Naples and Marco Island, Florida area, uh, rainfall of four to eight inches as, it, as Irma went through Florida, and widespread tree and wire damage. These were just a handful of photos from amateur radio operators uh, in the areas. Uh, multiple cranes blown over in downtown Miami. That was actually a report Julio gave to us to give to the National Hurricane Center since he was at uh, his other location. So here's just an example of how we can um, provide information, surface reporting, situational awareness, and several million were without power, and yet Irma, it wasn't the worst case scenario where it maintained its Cat 5 intensity going through Florida. It had weakened a little bit from uh, straight, uh, uh, scraping through Cuba on its way to the southwest part of Florida, yet um, being on that northeast side, uh, places like Miami, with the very powerful east winds and uh, coming right off of the ocean, some very strong winds on the east side of the storm. And that brings us to Hurricane Maria and some of the first reports of significant damage from Dominica came from amateur radio, came from our net as long with the Hurricane Watch net. And several of the amateurs, we had an amateur operator in St. Lucia who relayed the reports from Dominica, some of which are hams that have checked in with us in the past in our net, that suffered severe structural damage to their homes. And that was before the stronger east side of the hurricane had gone through the island. Uh, very devastating there. If you look on uh, Facebook, for those that have access um, and look up uh, Dominica and Amateur Radio, you'll find a Facebook page that had a lot of the stories uh, uh, from their area. There were hams there that were active for weeks on end um, in Dominica, providing uh, much of the same things that you heard about in Puerto Rico that uh, Mike pointed out. Very significant rainfall with mudslides. Uh, they were in a, a significant recovery mode. I think they are finally starting to come out of it, as uh, Puerto Rico is as well. Uh, as Maria then moved into the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico with, again, major structural damage. These photos that you see here were from our one of our net participants, uh, November Papa Three, Oscar Delta, Francisco, who uh, stayed with us uh, for much of the net. We actually had an amateur operator in the New York City area who was able to relay many reports to us from friends, from family, from other amateurs that he had contact with on the island. We have some of the recordings of reports um, as the net took place. Uh, you can see that here in a couple of the links. Uh, we also have a database uh, with a complete listing of reports that you can get to off our VOIP WX net website. There's a direct link here on uh, uh, this slide as well. And uh, uh, Mike Corey already mentioned the Force of 50 Puerto Rico mission. You can see some of that information on the league's website as well. These are just some of the credits. I mentioned a couple of the folks uh, and a few of the other folks that provided the pictures for some of the response and the reports that we received on our uh, hurricane net um, uh, this past season. And again, tremendous help to the hurricane forecasters. Some of that information went into advisories. Um, very, uh, very critical way for us to be able to provide the first ground truth of what's happening, which is very important for recovery efforts. A few of the things that we're doing for the new season, um, I, they, we've had a lot of talk about Zello, how it was used in, uh, by citizens in Texas to coordinate the massive uh, flood uh, recovery and rescue of, of people. 
Um, there are other apps out there that uh, are great for digital messaging. You know, one of the things that we are as amateur radio operators, we always have our core amateur radio modes, analog, digital, the, the modes are, and layers we have are tremendous. We are some of the best people equipped to manage some of the, these other communication forms out there, these apps and social media when they are available, because we know they aren't always available, but there are many times that they are, and we can make leverage of them uh, when they are available to us and fail over to our other systems that are, are more resilient um, when things start to go down. Uh, we, we can plug into these other ways of communication. We can provide our structure and how we communicate both on voice and data. Many of us have technical backgrounds. So uh, this is an area that we are exploring uh, within our uh, network. And again, trying to provide a situational awareness uh, mission that if things don't fail, we're in the middle of things, providing the damage and surface reports and, and awareness of maybe what stores are open versus closed, depending on the severity of damage, things of that nature that uh, make us useful in that mission such that if communications goes down, we're available also to, to fill the gaps in an all else fails mission. So uh, kind of our, we're evolving our net to a concept of virtual communications and situational awareness support. Uh, monitor, we've even monitored and relayed information uh, to local weather service forecast offices and local Skywarn coordinators via NWS chat and other means, monitoring different weather stations, uh, public safety and such. There's uh, plenty of different ways we can contribute in our ability to properly relay information. Remember, the, the one of the R's in ARRL is to be able to relay pertinent information and help get it verified. Um, those are some of the things that we are able to do. We, we can be a kind of a centralized source of Skywarn reporting and situational awareness. Preparations for the season. We did the communications test with WX4NHC last month. We're working on some migrations of our website to a WordPress type of site and migrating some of our email lists to uh, Groups.io. We're always looking for more net controls and we have a couple of new recruits that contacted us within the last month. Uh, continuing to uh, deepen our ties on listen-only capability during activations, trying to plan a net control training uh, for July of, 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 the, uh, of this year uh, for our net controls, always recruiting stations to be involved in our net, and we mentioned the virtual communications and situational awareness concepts. I'm going to touch really quickly on a couple of best practices in Skywarn for tropical systems. Hurricanes mean the hurricane nets are active, but tropical storms and, and, and post-tropical systems can pose uh, threats that for local and regional Skywarn programs, you should activate for. Some of the tropical storms, depending on their size and intensity, can be the equivalent to Category 1 hurricanes. Sometimes as these tropical systems transition to be post-tropical, they have, have many of the threats of a tropical system and, and warrant a local or regional Skywarn type of activation. So. I wanted to point those uh, comments out. So if you're a Skywarn coordinator, an emergency coordinator, you know, what's your posture based on the weather forecast? Be ready to activate Skywarn, even if it's not a hurricane uh, system and it's more, it's weaker. It's a tropical storm or a post-tropical system because there still may be threats of severe weather, flooding, still the, the, the possibility for strong to damaging winds. Don't assume media or social media has it covered. Situational awareness, disaster intelligence information, and being a force multiplier to manage those things is, is very important. And there still could be a scenario where it could deteriorate into a communications emergency, especially if it's a severe weather arrest threat that is posed by a tropical system where a strong tornado maybe knocks out um, communications. Most often those tornadoes and tropical systems are weak, but not always. So um, those are things to keep in mind, even when tropical systems are below hurricane strength. So just keep that in mind that um, even if a system is not a hurricane, if it is that um, uh, tropical depression or post-tropical cyclone or tropical storm, there could be weather threats that could mean local regional skywarn or, or possibly Aries activations and to be that force multiplier in those situations. Uh, just putting up these sites here, some of the information on IRLP and various Echolink and IRLP nodes, our uh, website. We are also on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we have our general uh, VOIP WXNet email list. It remains on Yahoo Groups for now, but we will be transitioning it to Groups.io, and it will transition uh, 
Uh, anybody that uh, signs up um, automatically will be doing that in a week or two's time, and we can help with any technical node problems or, or set up with new nodes as needed. And here's a few folks um, uh, within our net management team for contacts, and uh, also like to uh, mention Lloyd, our PIO, KC5FM, uh, who you can uh, reach at uh, KC5FM at ARL.net uh, as some of contacts for our net. And that concludes uh, my presentation here for uh, this evening, and uh, we'll uh, now pass it back to Mike and see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you, Rob. And I think we got a question that just uh, came in. Uh, is there a link to download? Uh, okay, the presentations, uh, each presenter is going to, it'll be up to them if they share their slide deck. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded, so it will be available later. And I want to thank everybody for hanging in with us tonight. Uh, I know we're running a little past schedule. We have one last presenter uh, on on uh, on the uh, agenda for tonight. So what I will, uh, I don't see any questions, uh, Rob, uh, too pressing. Um, and uh, I did get one question on uh, WX4NHC being active during field day. So, Julio, real quick, uh, WX4NHC going to be on for field day? Uh, no, Mike, uh, we will not. Uh, we can only do operations at the Hurricane Center uh, that are approved by them. And it's mainly during hurricanes, repairs, and our annual station test. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, okay, so with that, we will turn it over to our final presenter for this evening, uh, Bill Feast, WB8BZH from uh, Saturn. And uh, Bill, just turning the uh, controls over to you. Are you there? Yep, I sure am. Okay, it's all yours, Bill. All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to have you with us, and uh, we appreciate the time you're uh, putting into this this evening. Um, Real quickly, I know we're running late. Uh, most of you are familiar with Saturn. It is the group of amateur radio operators that supports the Salvation Army's uh, uh, Disaster Services Ministry with auxiliary and emergency communications uh, and technical support. Uh, we have a number of HF nets. Um, our daily net is at 10 o'clock uh, Central Time uh, in the uh, morning each day, Monday through Saturday on 14.265, and we have a digital net using Olivia 8500 with a 1500 hertz offset on 14.065 uh, at noon on Saturdays. Our primary missions for our nets are to provide regular practice and training for uh, all participating operators and to provide a standard frequency for handling emergency priority and health and welfare messages during emergencies or disasters. And a big uh, part of our ministry is just that, uh, providing a fellowship ministry for uh, amateur radio operators. Activation protocol, protocols, we do uh, do have a protocol for activating during a hurricane. Uh, generally, we will activate within 12 to 24 hours prior to the landfall of a major uh, hurricane. That is a Category 3, 4, or 5 hurricane. We will generally not activate for, yes. Uh, Bill, just a couple of things. Uh, we're not seeing your slide uh, set, and uh, your audio is distorting just a little bit. Uh, you're not seeing the slide set? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay, hang on a second. Can you, can you see that at all? Are you seeing anything at all coming down? No, no, we're just seeing the, uh, uh, the, the placeholding screen. Oh, wonderful. Um, okay, I'm not quite, let, let me just, let me try rebooting the uh, PowerPoint here and see if we can get it back up. Okay. Uh, uh, right. hmm? Yeah, um, Bill, let me, before you do that, let me just take the control back from you and then try giving you the, um, uh, the controls again to see if that works. Okay. Okay, so you should see the pop-up window. Yep. Okay, show my screen. That's probably what I did wrong. There we go. Uh, all righty. Good. All right. Let's let me catch up to where we're at here. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, as I said, we activate for uh, 12 to 20, uh, 24 hours prior to the landfall of a major hurricane. 
categories three, four, or five, we generally do not activate for uh, hurricanes that are not major hurricanes. Uh, we base the activation decision on uh, the current or expected uh, conditions, uh, the current or expected scope of damage or impact, and then also uh, we do work in coordination with our partners and obviously the needs of the Salvation Army are a primary factor in decision making as well. Okay, 2017 Atlantic hurricane season. Most of you have heard uh, multiple times about this. For us, it actually started with the uh, Great American Eclipse. And uh, then, of course, Harvey, Irma, and uh, Maria. Uh, so here's our overall statistics uh, for all of those events. Uh, uh, we were on the air for 32 days, uh, not continuously, but... Uh, uh, still out of uh, a two-month period, we were on the air for 32 days, and you can see the rest of the uh, statistics there. We handled well over 300 messages, and this was by far the longest operation in Saturn's 30-year history. Uh, we are uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, lessons learned. First of all, advanced preparation is critical for deployment outside of the local area. Um, we did put people on uh, standby for a deployment to Florida, as well as deployment to Maria. Uh, we have never had a uh, national uh, go team, and so we had to work pretty fast and pretty hard, much like uh, uh, Mike did for uh, the deployment to Puerto Rico for uh, putting our teams together. Uh, our folks were actually never deployed, uh, but that still didn't take away from the amount of work that goes into uh, putting the teams together. And so um, we learned the value of having the, uh, of getting some of that done ahead of time. And that includes pre-registration, it includes training, making sure our folks are uh, properly trained and credentialed uh, with an ID card and having done all the things that the Salvation Army requires for people to do for an ID card, uh, making sure that they have the skills and qualifications that are going to be needed. Uh, whether it's HF voice or digital or VHF, UHF, uh, and so on. Uh, that they have go kits. Uh, unlike the ARRL, we frankly don't have the money to uh, provide uh, uh, kits for them. So uh, folks uh, use their own equipment. And um, so we have to make sure that they have the, uh, uh, the equipment uh, needed for whatever the deployment requirements are. Um, partnerships. Absolutely vital uh, for all of us. Um, I think that was uh, proven very, uh, uh, very well in this 2017 uh, season. I know uh, both the hurricane, the, the hurricane watch net, AWRL, uh, Voice Over IP, WeatherNet, Mars, um, all of them were uh, big partners for us. Provided us with uh, information that we could pass on to uh, the Salvation Army. Uh, provided us with uh, operators and uh, net controls, particularly towards the end when our folks, uh, the, our operation from Maria lasted for 22 days straight. And towards the end, they were getting pretty tired out. And uh, a number of these organizations stepped up and provided us with a good quality uh, net control operators and relay stations. Um, I'm not sure we could have stayed on the air uh, without that help there towards the end. Um, and we, in turn, were able to uh, help uh, some of them with uh, with their requirements. Uh, we learned that with the Great American Eclipse, uh, where we supported both the AWRL and the American Red Cross. And uh, that turned out to be a really good practice session for what uh, needed to be done during uh, Maria. So uh, partnerships are, are, are critical, and I, I really encourage, even at the local level, to develop some of those par partnerships with other uh, with other clubs and other uh, organizations, we simply cannot continue to live in our own silos. Um, it's getting to the point where disasters are, are much bigger than any one organization can handle. Um, partnerships with your served agencies are also important. Uh, we need to understand our partners' missions. Uh, you need to understand your served agency's mission and what's important to, uh, to them. The flip side is also true. Your served agencies need to understand 
what amateur radio's capabilities and limitations are. Um, it's important for them to understand what you can and cannot do. And all of that has to be done ahead of time. Doing that in the middle of a disaster is not the time to be doing that. You uh, need to be doing that in advance and, and exercising that with your, uh, with your served agencies. Um, need to understand, fully understand the mission for deployment. If you are asked to deploy for a, a served agency, uh, you need to understand what their mission for you is uh, because that's going to determine the kind of equipment you need. It's going to determine the operator skills that are needed. And last but not least, always remember the emergency management motto, Simper Gumby, always flexible. I don't care what they tell you the mission's going to be, when you get there, chances are the mission's going to be different. Um, and you, you just simply have to go in prepared to do just about anything and everything that needs to be done and, and to be flexible in, in, in doing that because uh, disasters by definition uh, are, are chaos, and uh, part of our job is to bring uh, what order we can to the chaos uh, that exists as a result of the disaster. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Uh, we are, we're going to be doing a, a net rally from uh, June 25th through uh, 8th of uh, July. Uh, you can find out about all of this on the uh, Saturn uh, net. Um, and so, or not Saturn net, uh, on either the Saturn net or on Saturn.org, uh, either one. So, um, I encourage you to look into it because it, it should be a, um, a, a fun time for everybody. There's my contact information and I'm now open and available for questions. And somebody asked about the, uh, uh asked about, um, the slideshow. Uh, if you want it, uh, there's my email address uh, showing there. Uh, hopefully, that'll stay up for a couple of minutes. Feel free to write that email address down. Send me an email. I'll, I'll put the uh, presentation up in my Dropbox and uh, send you a link to it. Uh, over to you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Sorry about the uh, testing. I just realized the mic was hot. Um, okay. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and, uh, uh, I think we're actually uh, pretty good on caught up on questions. I know we're over our time and uh, we're, we're all sitting in here in the room watching the uh, the media feeds that uh, there's bigger news happening uh, uh, in the world right now, apparently. So, um, so I'm going to, uh, as we do each year uh, at the end, I'm going to just go through our presenters and give them one last chance for any, uh, any final thoughts. Um, uh, I'll start here in the room with, uh, with Dave. Uh, uh, anything before we uh, sign off? Um, no, I guess the one thing I would say is to, re to remind our folks to um, get to know their PIOs, find out who the PIO is for your organization. Um, if you're not sure who that is, check with the, the organizer of your group. And if your PIO um, there is looking for some assistance, feel free to reach out to, uh, to us at ARRLHQ and we'll be happy to help. Okay. Thank you, Dave. And uh, we'll go down the list. Uh, Bill. Um, any uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'll I'll go, I'll go ahead and start, uh, Mike. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody who's on this uh, webinar, particularly if you participated uh, in any of the activations last year, whether it was ours or Hurricane WatchNet or Voice Over IP Net or uh, WX4NHC or AWRL or, or whatever. Uh, if you were involved uh, last year uh, during the hurricane season, uh, I just want to say thank you because uh, none of us can do it without the uh, uh, the amateur radio volunteers uh, that come to our nets and uh, and help us do the work. So uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill and um, uh, Bob. Uh, any uh, any final thoughts before we go tonight? Yeah, just very quickly, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, attended the webinar this evening and everybody who sends in reports. As a meteorologist, uh, we're always looking for reports. Uh, uh, they're extremely valuable when we're trying to get a complete picture of a, of a storm that's approaching a certain area. And uh, the reports we get from the amateur radio community are, are outstanding. And 
uh, just to keep them coming and above all to have a very safe uh, hurricane season. Okay, thank you, Bob. And uh, I will turn it over to Julio for any final thoughts. Well, thank you to, to everybody who attended. And um, I would just like to say without everybody that's listening, without your participation, your relays or your reports, we would just be listening to static. So thank you very much and good luck during this hurricane season. Okay, thank you, Julio. And uh, last but not least, uh, Rob Macedo, uh, any final thoughts? If I can get you unmuted. There you go. Yeah, no, I, I just want to, again, I want to thank everybody for their participation. I, I think Bill, Bill Feast comments about no matter which network or which system you're in, we need everybody's support. When we all work together toward a common uh, goal, it's amazing the power of what we can accomplish. I think that's what we saw in Puerto Rico uh, with the Force of 50 and such. I, I think it's also what we saw during the um, hurricane that's we even had other amateurs who uh, reached out through their networks to give us information that we would not have had otherwise. So uh, a hearty thank you to all of you that participate and, and contribute. Uh, we'll see what the new season, uh, uh, hurricane season brings. Hopefully it's quieter than this past year, but um, as uh, Bob Robichaud's last slide said, it only takes one. So let's all be prepared and, and stay safe and Everybody also enjoy field day weekend coming up. And thanks, Mike, for the opportunity to present. Okay. Thank you, Rob. And uh, uh, thank you to our presenters tonight. Uh, just a reminder that the webinar uh, was recorded. We will post that to the ARRL YouTube channel later this week. If you would like to uh, get a copy of the slide set, just email the presenter. Uh, let me go ahead and get the uh, presenter's information uh, posted uh, so you have that. Um, so if you want a, a copy of the slides, uh, contact the presenter directly and uh, they, uh, it's up to them whether or not they, they choose to share uh, a copy of the slide set. So uh, with that, thank you to our presenters tonight. Uh, thank you for everyone for, uh, to everyone for taking part in this year's hurricane webinar and thank you for the service that you provide to your communities. As we do each year for hurricane season, we prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Here's to it being a quiet and safe year for our communities. Thank you for attending, and on behalf of all the presenters, 73.